Good morning. So to all who are here in person or whether you're joining us online, we're glad to have you worshiping here with us this morning. This is certainly a time of year when a lot of people are traveling and everyone has certain preferences about how they like to travel. Myself, my general preference is that I like to get off of the interstate and get on the back country roads to do the scenic countryside, you know, and do it that way. My family, however, prefers the opposite. They don't like it when I do that. They want the fastest, most boring direct pathway there, always the interstate. Uh, And so this summer, we took a family trip to Utah to see some national parks, and we drove. Yes, we drove uh, to Utah. And my family, like all families, has some highs and lows on long car trips like that. Uh, Three out of the five people in my family get motion sick. So that's fun, right? Right? My wife and I have a tendency sometimes to have different ways of thinking about how one should drive. (laughs) And that's fun, right? But it's family vacation and we're going to have fun, darn it. And so we drove, we're going to drive longer into Utah. So we took two days to drive there, uh, but we spread it out over two days. On the way back, we were going to drive from Moab, Utah to Columbia in one day. So uh, if you type it into Apple Maps, you can see there's three different routes you can kind of go, uh, you know, and one is just the straight shot path. I mean, it is getting on I-70 all the way through Colorado, Kansas, all the way to Columbia, and it takes about 15 hours to drive it. But if you want to avoid Kansas, let's just say, (laughs) right, you could go up to Nebraska and then down and just add an hour and a half of scenic Uh, beauty to your tour. Or if you really wanted to get crazy, you could actually go through Albuquerque to Amarillo to Oklahoma City and all the way back up and add four and a half hours. So you can imagine the outrage if I, on that trip back, took one of the scenic routes instead of taking the straight shot I-70 trip back home. I might have been beaten and left along the road, still kind of walking and trying to make my way back to Columbia. But if we can imagine such outrage and frustration overtaking the scenic route on a family vacation, imagine how the Israelites felt when God didn't take the straight path from Egypt into the promised land, but instead took the scenic roundabout way. Here's a map of, of, the, of the route that they took. So here's Egypt where they enslaved for hundreds of years. Here is the promised land that God had promised to give them to Abraham. And so there were ancient pathways, highways that they could have taken uh, that scholars say would have taken an 11-day walk. So the red path is the actual path that they went around and around, and that took them 40 years. So was it because they wanted to see all the sights? Did they take a wrong turn? Was their GPS system faulty? Well, we're going to meditate. We're going to do a theological meditation this morning on a couple verses in Exodus 13, verses 17 to 18. So let's read those verses. When Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them on the road through the Philistine country, though that was shorter. For God said, if they face war, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. So God led the people around by the desert road toward the Red Sea. The Israelites went up out of Egypt ready for battle. See, God promised a land flowing with milk and honey, a land where they would be fruitful, a land where they would be safe and free. Uh, And so as a result, though, instead of leading them straight to that land, he instead led them into the wilderness where there were no vineyards, no orchards, no pastures, no ranches. No walls, no fortresses, no permanent homes. Instead, they were left to live in tents for 40 years. And so, whoa, whoa, whoa. Why did God do that? Well, let's look again at the text. Uh, In the text, it says, For God said, if they face war, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. See, God knew what they could handle. He knew what they couldn't handle. And so instead of taking them on that 11-day straight shot trip back to the promised land, they would, if they went that way, they would face a fight with the Canaanites, give up and turn around and come back to Egypt in order to be slaves again. And God was more committed to getting them to the promised land than he was to doing it quickly. 
God was more committed to act in their long-term good rather than giving them what they wanted in the short term. And God guides us in that roundabout way too, just like he did the Israelites because he's committed to getting us home. And when we become a Christian, we might experience a new freedom, a new joy, a new peace that we hadn't felt before. I know that I have found the Christian life far more satisfying than the way I was trying to live before. And yet whatever joy and peace and satisfaction we experience in following Jesus in this life, it's just a taste of what awaits us in the life to come. None of us have experienced the fullness of God, of what God promises. None of us have arrived at the home that we're all longing for. And the Israelites were wandering around in the roundabout way in the wilderness after having been rescued and redeemed and saved from slavery in Egypt. And they were on their way to the promised land. They were in between being saved and being home. And that is a picture of what the Christian life is like. There, when we put our faith and our trust in Jesus, we are rescued, we are redeemed, we are forgiven, and yet we're not fully home, but are on a roundabout way journey to our true home. And if this life is meant to feel more like the roundabout way in the wilderness than being at home in the promised land, then this is really important for us to understand because it shapes what we should expect from this life and it shapes what it means to live well on this roundabout way. And so if God has us on the roundabout way like he did the Israelites, then we should expect this life to be more dissatisfying than we would want. We should expect to be led through more hardships than we would want. We should expect the path to feel longer at times than we would want. Good news, right? But the great hope, though, is that God is committed to getting us home, even through all of that. And so let's go a little bit deeper into these. Let's start with life will be more dissatisfying than we would want. You see, God promised the Israelites what would be really satisfying, living in a land filled with milk and honey. But the Israelites, for those 40 years in the wilderness, had manna, quail, and water to eat and drink. They would just sit around like, this is just so much like human nature. They would just sit around and remember what they ate when they were slaves in Egypt. Fish, onion, garlic, cucumbers, leeks. And they would just even get themselves stirred up where they'd go, well, let's just go back and be slaves again so that we could eat the menu that we want. And they were just so sick of what uh, God had given them. And so they wanted to go back to be slaves in Egypt, even though they were crying out to God before that, save us from slavery. This is miserable. And God promises what he has prepared for us when we go to our true home is greater than we can even imagine, even more than a land flowing with milk and honey. We will be fully satisfied, but none of us experience that now. We instead get the manna, the quail, the water metaphorically, because we should expect in this life to feel dissatisfied because our desires are bigger than anything in this world can satisfy. There is no amount of success that will be enough. There is no amount of vacations and adventures that will be enough. There's no amount of shows on Netflix that we can watch, no amount of championships that the Chiefs can win, no amount of video games that we could conquer that will be enough. No love relationship, no romance will be enough. No alcohol and drugs will be enough. The only thing that will be enough to satisfy us is the home that God is preparing us and being at home with him there. And so in this life, we're going to long for more than what we can get out of this life. But we can't go backwards thinking that we're gonna be satisfied if we go backwards. Backwards is slavery. Going back to Egypt for the Israelites was returning to be a slave. And all of these unmet desires that we experience in this life tempt us to abandon the road home and instead to live just for this life. But we're so prone to forget that chasing and indulging all of our desires in, in, in this life doesn't really satisfy us. When we binge on these good things and center our lives around them, thinking that they're going to satisfy us instead of trusting God and following him and centering our lives around him, 
we end up misusing these things. They enslave us. They addict us. And they make us lesser versions of ourselves. And so what helps us to stay the course and keep going home when we have these unmet desires? Well, the Israelites needed to remember that God promises to provide for them even in the wilderness. He promised to ultimately satisfy them with the home that he's leading them to, a land flowing with milk and honey. But he also promised to provide what they need, not necessarily what they want, but what they need as they walk through the wilderness. And we can keep going by remembering that God promises to provide what we need, not necessarily what we want as we travel along this roundabout way in this life. See, if we're going to travel well on the roundabout way, then we must learn to cultivate contentment with what God provides rather than spending our lives longing for what he hasn't given us. We need to learn to not chase the illusions that promise to fully satisfy us in this life when that's not going to happen. We need to be careful about cultivating an unhealthy discontentment with what God provides. You know, maybe we need to be careful about how many home improvement shows we watch. You know, maybe we need to be careful about how many home decorating magazines we read or how we're using social media and all these ways that keep us from cultivating a healthy contentment with what we already have, with the bodies we have, with the friendships we have, with the place that God has us. Maybe we need to stop dreaming about and planning the next vacation when we just got back from the first one, that we miss out on the life that God has us here, even amidst the mundane ordinariness of our lives. You see, contentment trains us to say that none of these things are necessarily bad. These can even be good gifts that God wants us to enjoy, but that the stuff of this life won't fully satisfy us if we try to use them that way. And so we learn to say, that's enough in order to live out the other priorities that God has for us. And as we learn to cultivate contentment with what God provides, we find the surprising truth that this is actually a more satisfying way to live than actually chastening and indulging more and more stuff trying to fill us. Everyone has to face unmet desires in this life, but some of us feel this profoundly, maybe even some here this morning. The ache for what we long for makes it hard to believe that God is providing for what we need. We may not know why God withholds some blessings from us in this life. But whatever God withholds, he does so because he loves us and he's committed to getting us home. So not only should we expect to feel dissatisfied, but if God has us on the roundabout way, then we should expect to be led through more hardships than we would want. One of the promises that God made to the Israelites is that they'd be safe and secure in the promised land. And we can imagine how encouraging that would be after years of being mistreated as slaves in Egypt. But on the roundabout way, God led them into all kinds of hardships. Other nations wanted nothing more than to wipe Israel off the face of the earth, and yet God led them into open country without any walls, without any fortresses. God led them into all kinds of dangers in the wilderness. The heat, the desert, wild animals, lack of food, lack of water. I mean, it seemed like the opposite of safety and security. And yet God told them he would would be their safety and security, even amidst through those hardships. He wouldn't take them away from those hardships. It's not wrong to want safety and security. It's not. But to make us fully safe right now, God would have to pull us out of this world, and that's not what God promises to do. Nor does, it, does he promise that the path that he leads us on will avoid hardships, but he promises us his presence with us. He promises us ultimate security in the life to come, but even through the hardships now in this life, he promises to be with us and to give us what we need. And we live in a day and age when it seems so easy to cultivate fear and anxiety. We have global news that's telling us all the things that could go wrong or are going wrong in the world today. And it seems that some news sources have seemed to make their business model making us uh, in a constant state of, of outrage and distress about what's going on in the world. And if we end up consuming too much of a diet of this, it's easy to begin to see the world in a, in a godless way. Meaning, 
that we see the world absent of God being at work, even amidst the chaos and the hardships of the world. That we don't believe that God is at work in the chaos and the hardships of our life. And we miss out experiencing the peace that comes from believing that God is present with us, even through the hardships. And perhaps the best way to cultivate this kind of peace is to surrender. See, God wants us to go through hardships with him. And that means he wants us to come to him and tell him the things that we're worried about, the things that we're afraid of, and then to be able to yield it to him, to trust that he knows the path that we should go better than we do, and to remember that he promises to be with us. And thirdly, if God is leading us on the roundabout way, then we should expect it to feel longer than we would want it to be. And so the Israelites had to live in tents in the wilderness for 40 years when they could have gone a straight path that would have taken 11 days. And can you imagine how hard it would be to trust God through that? Can you imagine how you would wonder if, if you would ever get to that promised land, if it was going to be worth it? And when I was a young Christian in college, my life changed so much in a short span that I thought the Christian life was going to feel quick and easy. And now, as I'm approaching 50, I think the road has felt longer than I ever thought it would. And I realize that I have so much longer even still to go than I thought was, I was going to feel like. It has taken me longer to become the person that I want to be. It's taken me longer to heal from the wounds that I didn't even know I had at the time. It has taken, me, taken more perseverance through more hardships, through more unmet desires than I thought I would have to go through. But this is what we should expect if God is leading us on the roundabout way. And so let's pause and wrestle with a couple questions here. The first is, why doesn't God just give us what he promised us? Why not give us full bank accounts so that we don't have to worry, we don't have to be stressed, we don't have to feel insecure? Why not heal us fully now so that we don't have to live with pain, with disease or disabilities why not satisfy all of our wants now? Well, the continual temptation for the Israelites on the roundabout way was to either go back to Egypt and be slaves again or was to stay where they were in the wilderness, make a home there, and stop headed towards the promised land. And God was committed to making sure that they didn't make their home in this world apart from him and apart what he had promised to give them. And so he gave them what they needed, not what they wanted, nor what he fully promised. And we're tempted to make our homes in this world and to give up waiting on the life to come. And so perhaps God doesn't give us full bank accounts because we'd end up just trusting in them rather than in him. Perhaps God doesn't give us full healing in this life because we need to be woken up to remember that this world isn't our home so that we keep heading forward. God knows that we would be satisfied with far too little in this life and miss out on the amazing things that come from trusting in him and waiting on him and following him. Then why doesn't God just take us home right away? Why doesn't he just take us up to be with him right after we put our trust in Jesus? Then we can wait it all out until he makes all things right. Well, if God hasn't brought us home yet and we're still on the roundabout way, that's because God has a purpose for us here in this life. It's a purpose to live more and more for the purpose of what he's doing and why he hasn't come back to make all things right yet. Because perhaps we have a part to play in helping people not chase after the false illusions and abandon the path home. Perhaps we have a part to play in helping other people make it through their own hardships that they have to go through on their path on the way home. Perhaps we have a part to play in inviting others to join us on the path to our true home. Because if every Christian was pulled from the earth, who would be left to tell people about Jesus? Look at why Peter says Jesus hasn't returned yet and brought about the end of the world so that we could all be home. Because even in his day, people were saying, Jesus is taking so long to come back. Why? And in 2 Peter 3, 9, it says, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. You see, Jesus hasn't returned to take us all home because he is still bringing others home. 
Jesus is calling all of us who are following him to join him in this mission and to join with others who are on this mission. So, uh, you know, I used to think of the life, uh, the Christian life as a marathon. And a marathon is a good metaphor, right? Because it means that the, the race is gonna feel longer than we would like. There's more uphills and downhills, but it's ultimately about just you running the race. Well, there is a television show that came out about, oh, 10 years or so ago called Spartan Ultimate Team Challenge. And in this, you're running the race with a team. You don't finish until your whole team crosses the finish line. Uh, and you run into several obstacles all along the way that you can't complete on your own, that you need other people's help in order to get over. The last obstacle almost always was the slick wall. And there's no way that it, one person could make it over the wall on their own. You needed to stand on each other's shoulders. You, you needed to have someone who got to the top who could help pull up the other people. And so when I think about what it means to run the race well, to finish well now in the Christian life, this is the image that stick, sticks more in my mind. Because there are gonna be unmet desires that are more intense than we can handle on our own. There are gonna be stretches that are gonna feel so hard that we can't handle it on our own. Stretches that seem so long and wearying in the Christian life that we can't make it alone. We need others in order to make it to the end. And that's why to travel well on the roundabout way, we need to travel with others who are on their way home too. This is how we cultivate perseverance in the long stretches on the roundabout way home. We travel with others. And at the crossing, we have all kinds of groups and studies and classes that will be starting up this fall. Maybe if you haven't been in one, it's a time and a window to step into one, to travel well with others, to learn from others and make some connection with others, open up with others about what's hard. Now, maybe it's time to jump back in one if it's been a while since you've been in one. And so that's something what it looks like to travel well when the stretches get long. But if you're like me, all of this is hard. Uh, I don't like the fact that God is taking me uh, in this long, roundabout way rather than taking me on the short way home, the quick, easy way. And so how do we trust God when this is where he leads us? And so how did the Israelites do it? Well, one, they stumbled in all kinds of ways. It was tough for them to trust God. But they could always look back and look at the miracles that God did and, you know, the plagues, the parting of the Red Sea. And they could look back and they say, look at what he's done to deliver us. And this is what he's promised us. Surely he's able to get us home. Surely he loves us and cares for us and will finish the, what he started. And the miracles of the Exodus are just a mere foretaste of the greater deliverance that Jesus has made possible in his life, in his death, in his resurrection. And so we too can look back and see, look at what God has done. Look at what he endured in order to save us. And even though we're not home yet, and at times when it feels long and hard and difficult, it's hard to know sometimes that God is providing for us. It's hard to feel like he is with us. It's hard to feel like he has a purpose for us, much less that he loves us. And yet we can look back to the cross and remember that he does. If he is that committed, if he is committed enough to do that for us, surely he's committed to finishing the job in our life. You see, God doesn't promise, though, to connect all the dots for us in this life as to why he leads us in the ways that he does or why he gives us what he does compared to what he gives to other people. But Exodus 13, 17 to 18 remind us that God knows what we can handle and what we can't and that he is committed to getting us home. The question is, is are we willing to trust him? Are we willing to follow him, wait on him? Columbanus was a sixth century Irish missionary and monk, and he wrote this poem. What are you, human life? You are the road to life, not life itself. You are to be traversed, but not inhabited, for no one dwells on a road but travels it, so that those who walk upon the road may dwell in their homeland. You see, how do we view this life? Is it our home or is it the road to home? And if it's the road to home, the road is going to feel longer at times. 
It's going to take us through some hard stretches, and it's going to be hard at times to keep going forward and not go back. But the home that we have been looking for all of our life will be worth whatever hardships we had to go in order to get there. The road will seem easy and short compared to the joy of being home. C.S. Lewis, in the last battle, the last of his Chronicles of Narnia books, he tries to help us to feel like what it'll feel like when we get home to the new heavens and the new earth, when he describes it this way. The difference between the old Narnia and the new Narnia was like that. The new one was a deeper country. Every rock and flower and blade of grass looked as if it meant more. I can't describe it any better than that. If ever you get there, you will know what I mean. It was the unicorn who summed up what everyone was feeling. He stamped his right forehoof on the ground and he neighed and then he cried, I have come home at last. This is my real country. I belong here. This is the land that I've been looking for all of my life, though I never knew it till now. The reason why we love the old Narnia is that it sometimes looked a little like this. Friends, let's trust God to get us there through those hardships, through those unmet desires, through those long stretches, and to bring us to this home. Amen. Amen.